Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. This is actually episode 50, so we've been doing these for about a year every single week now. So thanks for sticking with me through all these videos. Anyway, guys, you guys remember the format. We're going to take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. If that all sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. All right, this video is brought to you by our new website, webuyguns.com. If you are considering selling a firearm or firearms collection, please consider logging onto our website and create an account. You can then submit your firearms for an offer request. We generally respond to those within about 24 hours, and with those offers, you will get a printable certificate, which you can take with you to your local gun store to try and get yourself a better deal on your firearm. If you're unable to get a better deal, go ahead and sell it to us. We do provide you with a shipping label, and we will pay you with either an ACH direct deposit or a paper check to make the process as seamless and easy for you as possible. Again, please remember to go check us out on webuyguns.com. Remembering the format of this video, we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. First up, I have a Shield First Generation Performance Center 9mm, which comes to us from a viewer in North Carolina. Now, as many of you know, I have personally been a big fan of the Smith & Wesson Shield since it came out on the market in about 2012. That's when I purchased mine. At the time, I want to say I paid about $500 for it, so they were obviously quite a bit more expensive then. Now, they've come down in price as other things like the Performance Center came out, which you see here, the 2.0, uh, and now the Shield Plus. So the first gen base models should be relatively easy and inexpensive to find uh, on the market. Of course, you know, withholding all the interesting things that are going on in the marketplace right now. But we've had them new as low as like $280 in our store before. So maybe we'll uh, see times like that in the future. Now the Performance Center is something that they have done on a lot of their other firearms, not just the Shield lines. You find them on their other MMPs as well. And the MMP line in general came out in about 2005. Uh, on the Performance Center, you do have a ported barrel with the ports in the slide as well, and they added a set of high-vis fiber optic sights just to enhance the overall usability and stylization of the firearm itself. Now, these would typically come with a slightly higher price tag, as new as would be expected. Um, and the value of these has really stayed up on the market. I mean, right now, you're finding the Performance Center shields uh, used maybe in the 450 to 550 range, depending on what it comes with, condition and stuff like that, uh, you know, which is about what they used to sell for brand new. Now, with the 2.0s and the Shield Plus is out on the market, it's probably going to squeeze the pricing on this type of stuff down as, as time goes on, as I think the Shield Plus will basically become the standard. And these are going to be pretty hard uh, to sell, which is what you find with like the first gen XDSs and stuff like that. Huge following on these. But again, as those pluses uh, become more prevalent in the marketplace, I think they're going to be kind of, you know, they are technically at this point antiquated technology. But I do really enjoy mine. This one comes to us from a viewer in North Carolina. So thank you so much for sending that along to us. That's going to be our number one spot, the Smith & Wesson M&P Shield Performance Center. Okay, up next is a pistol that not too many people may know about. And this one actually comes to us from a viewer in Georgia. So thank you so much for sending this one to us. This is the A-Rex Rex-01, specifically this is the Compact. Now these would actually enter the US market in about 2016, and this is a design out of Slovenia and imported by the Fine Group out of Las Vegas. At first glance, you will notice that it looks very, very similar to a SIG P226. Now this is the Compact version, so it'd be more closely equatable to the SIG P229 in that regard. Now also when you pick one up, you're going to notice that the grip is quite a bit thicker than the 226, and that's, you know, one of the big gripes it gets, and also the second gripe it gets is the double action trigger also being pretty heavy. And this one isn't so bad, but it's definitely heavier than on a P226. Now your features and your operations are going to be similar to a 226. You have the lever uh, actuated decocker here on this side. Now this does also incorporate a safety which the 226 does not have. Now 
On the used market right now, these have really not climbed up that much. You might be able to pick one of these up for about the $500 price range. Uh, new, they used to be about five to $600. You maybe have been able to find them for about 400 previously to all the craziness in the market. So they've crept up a little bit to maybe about five. Um, so they are very affordable. Again, not a lot of people know about them and some people look at them as a cheap knockoff of the SIG 226. These are actually very, very well made and very robust handguns. In fact, there are some other people on YouTube, I think Military Arms Channel specifically, who did a gauntlet test uh, this against the P226 and found that this was actually able to withstand more abuse than the 226 was. So uh, for a reliability and a durability standpoint, it actually performs very well. Now, I personally did a comparison video of this versus the P226 uh, on my channel maybe two or three years ago, shortly after it was released to the country, maybe back in 2017. So you can go back and look for that if you want to see more of a head-to-head -head spec comparison, tabletop comparison of the two. But anyway, if you're looking for something, again, that's a really good value, really attractive looking firearm, has good ergonomics, again, a little bit on the beefier side and I have pretty small hands. Um, this is something you shouldn't overlook and you know it's good to have the opportunity to include this one on the video or for those of you who might not know that it exists. But anyway, thanks again to my viewer in Georgia and there is the A-Rex Rex 01 imported by Fine Group. Okay, up next is a really cool little pocket pistol that has a little bit more history to it than would meet the eye. This is a Beretta Model 418. Now, development for this would begin around 1919 to 1921 when uh, the Italian arms manufacturer Beretta would want a small vest pocket size 25 caliber pistol. And this would rival things that were popular on the market, such as the Browning vest pocket. Colt had a little variation of something similar to this. So remember, around the turn of the century, uh, you get in through the 1900s to the 1920s, the little vest pocket self-defense pistol concept was gaining a lot of momentum, especially in the United States, but also abroad in Europe and other places as well. So this was Beretta's offering. Now, we get into World War II and Italy, you know, starts getting into the emergence of the Second World War under Mussolini and uh, Italy develops the 1934 and 1935 pistols, respectively, in 32 automatic and 380. Now, those are actually their standard issue military sidearms going on from the Galassi, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from World War I, which is a more full-size pistol, somewhat similar in look to a Luger, kind of gives you an idea on the size, or Glacenti. Um, and it was very peculiar that Italy would go to as much of a small compact size. And again, those, uh, the 34 and the 35 were not much larger than this, maybe, uh, you know, about that much taller and maybe about that much longer. So it looks similar to this, but just a little bit larger for the larger calibers. And that was it. That was their standard issue. Now, these would be popular and, and kept in service and purchased on the private market by Italian officers, kept as a personal defense firearm. So they would have seen military service. And even some of these would be purchased by German. Uh, elements as well. Again, kept as personal defense sidearms for officers and things of that nature. You could usually distinguish those like you can the 34 and the 35 with the four UT uh, acceptance markings as well. Now, beyond World War II, these would stay in production until about 1950, and they would be introduced into the U.S. civilian market under such names like the Bantam and the Panther. Um, and they were not very expensive. Again, around the time of the 50s to 60s, this concept, again, of the vest pocket pistol was sort of falling off and not remaining popular. Now, of course, by today's standards, we can get similar things with a polymer frame chambered in 380, like the LCP and the uh, bodyguard and things like that. So the 25 automatic in this size just isn't a thing we really see anymore. Now, one other interesting thing about the 418 is it's used in pop culture. And many people may not know this unless you're a diehard James Bond fan, but this was actually the pistol that James Bond would have theoretically started off with. So at the beginning of its life, the James Bond series, it was basically stated that he carried a 25 automatic Beretta pistol. It was never really named, but at the time, this is really the only option. Now, there were earlier iterations of the 418 that it could have been, but most likely James Bond would have gone with the final design culmination, which would have been this pistol, the 418. So this is likely what he started with until it was replaced by his 32 caliber PPK. Uh, and so just interesting to think about James Bond running around fighting crime with this little pistol with a suppressor on it. So uh, funny thing there for pop culture. Now this came into our store from a uh, local customer. So thank you so much for selling this one to us. Uh, the market. 
These are not overly expensive in really, really, really good condition. They might top off at five to $600. Something like this, there's quite a bit of wear on it, but is otherwise original. Uh, might be about the $300 mark. So anyway, really, really cool pistols. 418, I don't think I've had one in here before. Maybe one other since I've been open. Uh, so they're not too common to find, uh, but then again, not overly expensive as well. So really, really cool. 418, if you're a World War II fan, Italian small arms fan, or James Bond fan, something like this may have have a place in your collection if you find one in your local uh, gun store or gun show. So there it is, a 418. Okay, up next is a very interesting pistol slash rifle combo, if you will, that comes out of the 1960s. This is the Thompson Center Contender. Single shot top break. I'm going to pull this stuff out with multiple barrel conversion, which was essentially the brainchild of Warren Center. Now, he had begun working on this concept on his own time in about the early 1960s, and by 1965, he had come up with this concept. Now, the whole idea here is that it is a brake top, single shot pistol. Now, there were also stock variations of this, so you could also convert it into a rifle. And these would traditionally have been manufactured in lower calibers at the time, lower pressure calibers. Now, he had a great design and a great concept. He needed a way to mass manufacture this design and market it, so in about 1965, he would join forces with K.W. Excuse me, Thompson uh, Tooling Company, and together they would work on manufacturing, mass producing, and marketing this design concept as the Thompson Center Contender. In about 1967, this would actually enter the market. Shortly thereafter, they would be incorporated as Thompson Center, and that's as we know them today. Now, currently on the market, there exists a Generation 2, which they call the G2, which is a refined version, a little bit more safety features added, reduced cost of manufacturing and cost on the product overall. And they have upwards of 40 different barrel configurations for all sorts of different calibers. Is you know, 44 Magnum, 30, 30, 22 Long Rifle, 223, 222, 45, 70, the list goes on. Uh, they have the polymer grit versions, and of course, you can get the rifles. Uh, you can get the rifle barrel links that are, you know, out, of course, well past 16 inches to uh, comply. Now, I've actually been asked this question. It's pretty interesting. Can you own the pistol with the rifle conversion at the same time? Uh, could that be in, in, you know, constructive intent, you know, by the ATF to, because potentially you would have the parts there to make an SPR. I guess the same thing would be true if you had a takedown uh, 1022 rifle and a, uh, one of the takedown charger pistols it might get you in the same boat. I don't know, as long as you don't actually put them together, but that's neither, neither here nor there. But anyway, these are really, really cool uh, pistol slash rifles uh, with a lot of variability and, or variability, excuse me, and the way that you can configure these things for your own personal needs, mainly for hunting use. And that's really what it was intended to be was a hunting uh, firearm. Uh, at the time that it was marketed, it was more expensive than other options on the market, but this idea of a caliber conversion was very new and innovative. They would get into the larger calibers through about the 1970s as the Magnum cartridges would become more popular in the consumer market. So again, something that's really been along for about, you know, the past 60 years. Pricing. Um, because of all of the different variations in the barrels, uh, the stock, the pistol grip, and all of that. In good condition, these start at a standalone price of probably between four to $500. Now, when you start adding all the conversion parts and everything to it, the price can go way up from there. You know, really sky's the limit. If you have a set with all 40 barrels, you know, that could be worth, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. But anyway, you start with a base price of maybe about $500 and then start adding on from there as you go up with other, uh, other configurations and whatnot. But anyway, a really, really cool firearm. I've had a couple of these sets in here before, uh, so they're not super uncommon. Again, as they've been around for about the past 60 years or so, but cool nonetheless, have a lot of different applications, fun on the range or fun for hunting, you know, whatever you want to do with them. So kind of an end all do all uh, package for multiple different uses. Uh, this one here has a 222 barrel, a 44 Magnum barrel, and a 45 Colt slash 410 barrel as well. So again, kind of a cool variety there. So there is that, the Thompson Center Contender. Okay, up next is a really cool pistol that comes to us from a viewer in Pennsylvania. This is a Llama M87 9mm target or competition style firearm which came onto the scene in about the mid to late 1980s. Now, Llama as a company, it was actually started as a company called Gabilando in about 1904. And they would come out with some such things like the Ruby 32 automatic pistol, which was popular around World War I, World War II era with some varying degrees of success. 
And then through about the 80s and 90s, they would come out with 1911 variations, like you guys saw the 3A that we had on here a couple weeks ago. Uh, the Micro 380 1911, which would predate the designs by Colt. And then, of course, the double stack uh, 45 ACP 1911s, which were pioneered from Para Ordnance, which they would copy in about the 1990s. But one other thing that they worked on was a copy of the Beretta Falling Block type action, which they came out with as the Model M82, which was a design that they started working on in 1986. Now, in 1987, that would actually go into the Spanish military pistol trials, where it would be adopted uh, again as the M82, and I think is actually still serving as the primary issue sidearm in, in Spain today. Um, out of that as well came this variation, the M87, which was designed primarily as an export civilian commercial firearm, which came into the uh, to the United States in about the late 1980s, and again would be produced until about uh, 1998, 1999. So it had a manufacture run of about 10 to 11 years. Now, when these came in, they were pretty pricey for the time, uh, but were still also met with a really good degree of success. It is a very comfortable firearm with a really nice balance, a excellent trigger and show you guys that so a little bit of creep there but it's actually it, the take up stays and you apply a little bit of pressure right into a clean break and show you guys the reset right there's the reset clean break so does that again so there's the reset right there really really light really really clean really cool pistol on the market today, these are not super common. You can find them at about, I would say they start, depending on condition of what they come with, about the $600 range plus. Uh, so they do go up from there. You know, typically around seven to $800 is where you see most of these. In premium condition, they go up from there. So anyway, really, really cool pistols. Really glad to get this one in. And again, thank you to our viewer in Pennsylvania. Okay, up next, I have a couple really cool revolvers from Ruger. Now this one up here is a new model single six, and this one comes to us from a viewer in Massachusetts. And down here I have an old model or just a basic single six, which comes to us from a viewer in Montana. So thank you both for sending these along to us. And it's great to actually have one of each for the purposes of this video. So the original single six revolver would come out in about 1953. And remember, this is just post-World War II, and this also comes with the rise of all the interest in the old Western style uh, film and media that was coming out of Hollywood and you know other places like that. Colt had just come out with a new model of the single action army back to their lineup again as post-war production now that the manufacturers are not required to have you know their wartime production or anything like that so you did have a lot of manufacturers that were coming out with a single action army style firearm to compete out on the market and colt would actually come out with a variation similar to that the frontier uh line as well which would sort of serve this market as well where you could have that nice single action stylizing of the firearm Let's see half cock yep of the firearm without needing to get something of you know full size or expensive like a Colt single action army which even at the time was pricey um you could get something like this take it out to the range and enjoy it and it is more or less a pretty close approximation or pretty close feel to the single action army with some modernization aspects like updated sights uh this did not have a firing pin mounted onto the face of the hammer but you could still go to half cock and use it. Now, things today like the Wrangler even simplify it even further. Uh, the Bearcat as well as a scaled down survivalist version of the single action, but the single six was really the closest thing you could get from Ruger's catalog and the 22 Rimfire. Uh, now they made them, them in a couple other calibers as well, but 22 is most prolifically what you see them in. Uh, that being said, this one has a 22 Magnum conversion barrel as well. So through about the 1950s, they would manufacture this. Uh, one of the biggest differences they would make until about 1973 is they decided to increase the safety of the firearm. So they would move from the old model here in 1973 to the new model, which you see here. And really the only change that was made is they went, actually two changes. Uh, one is you did not have to go to half cock to open and move the cylinder. That's indicative of what you're gonna see on the Wrangler today. The other thing they did is they added a transfer bar. So the transfer bar, for those who don't know, and I can bring these in for you both to see, if those are focusing okay. So uh, on this side here, the transfer bar is an arm that raises up and allows the back of the hammer to connect with the back of the firing pin. 
Now here on the old model, you do not have that. So if you do have a round in the chamber with the hammer back and something were to break the sear and send that hammer to the back of the primer or the back of the firing pin, it will ignite, it will fire. So like they used to do on the single action armies, you load one, skip one, load four to keep it indexed on an empty cylinder. You would have to do the same thing here if you were gonna carry it. Uh, going to a transfer bar, you do not have that need because the transfer bar stays down, not allowing the hammer to connect with the firing pin until the trigger is pulled. When you pull the trigger, the transfer bar moves up, allowing them to connect. So if it's back and you break it, the trigger wasn't pulled, it doesn't matter. The two cannot connect and will not fire. And that's what you're gonna find not only on some uh, Ruger revolvers today, but also Smith & Wesson, uh, Taurus, other things like that as well. So it sort of has become the standard. Uh, this is essentially one of the places that it started. So anyway, very interesting to have both an old and new model here. Now, if we get into the pricing, the old models are, are going to be a little bit more desirable, especially the old three screw design, a little bit more collectible with its box and spare cylinder. You know, you might get these things up at words in about the $600 price range, plus, you know, somewhere abouts in there. Um, the old model, or I'm sorry, the new models, again, no box or anything like this, a little bit less collectible. You're going to bring in less money than that, maybe the, the three to $400 range, respectively. Um, but anyway, they are really nice shooters, a lot of collectors out there for them. Uh, so again, you're looking at old model 53 to 73, and then the new model 73 and beyond. So anyway, really cool to get those in, happy to share them. All right, up next is a really beautiful over-under shotgun that comes to us from a viewer in Ohio. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. This is a Beretta Silver Pigeon 686, chambered in 12 gauge. Now I'm not gonna assemble this. Um, there's really not a lot of history to these. Now these would come about in about the 1990s. They're similar to the 50 series over-under shotguns from Beretta. Main differences being that those would have uh, used more of a leaf spring uh, type system, whereas these would use the more modern coil spring. Uh, as well as the earlier 1950s models, the, the lower iterations of those would not have automatic ejectors, whereas that has become standard on the 686 or the Silver Pigeon series, uh, like you see here. Now, these have actually become one of the, if not probably the most popular and most owned uh, over under shotguns for uh, clay shooting enthusiasts as well as uh, you know bird hunting you know, things along those lines because you are getting a really really high quality shotgun for a pretty reasonable price uh, on the market today new around 2000 you know the used ones do span of course the different conditions and grades and everything will span between a thousand to two thousand dollars respectively so they are not super cheap but they are not overly expensive like some of the higher end beretta uh, benelli shotguns um I mean, when you get into this sport with over-unders, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 is actually pretty entry level. So they go way up from there. Really, really nice wood grain on this one. A little bit of somewhat of a tiger striping here in the wood grain, which is just overall really nice. Some handling marks and stuff on it. Uh, they did use removable chokes, of course, automatic ejectors. Um, just a really cool shotgun. Again, not much else really to say about it, but if you are interested in getting into uh, clay shooting or something along those lines. This is a really good one to look at again not super cheap There are over under shotguns out there that are less expensive But if you want a good compromise between value and, and uh, price and, and quality the 686 silver pigeon is always one that people tend to go with so anyway really really cool to get that in Thank you to our viewer again in Ohio uh, 686 silver pigeon. Okay, last but not least is a very rare pistol and this one comes to us from a viewer in Michigan This is an AMT auto Auto Mag 5 chambered in 50 Action Express. Now this would actually come onto the market in about 1993 and only be manufactured for about two years until about 1995. Now there were intended to be about 3,000 of these manufactured but fewer than that were actually fully assembled and marketed and sold uh, here in the local market. Now that would assume that the Dash 3000, which I've seen on all the variations I have, is probably meant to max out the serial number range of the first three digits, in this case being 207, uh, being the, the unit manufactured, so the 207th one produced. But again, not very many were made. Uh, we looked at the uh, 58, yeah, it's actually, it was a 44 Magnum Desert Eagle and discussed the 50 Action Express in last week's video. This was actually the first firearm that would actually be chambered in that round coming before the Desert Eagle. So this would be it, you know, it wasn't really designed for this handgun, but this would be the first one to incorporate it. They made these in the 44 Magnum as well, a 30 carbine. Uh, I, 
a couple other cartridges as well, but one of the most elusive and most rare, of course, would be the one chambered in 50 Action Express, which we have right here. Very, very uh, large firearm cast stainless steel, nice ergonomics and actually a really nice trigger, but they just it's just one of those things that with the overall lightweight, this is considerably lighter than a Desert Eagle. This is absolutely a bear to shoot, even to people who are pretty experienced. Um, so the the popularity of this did not really stick, and of course it went out of production pretty shortly after it first came into the marketplace. Now the price on these is pretty wide. Um, this does not have its original box or anything. I've seen them start at about below 2000 to about the $2,000 range uh, without their box and stuff like that, and then upwards of 3000 if they have all of their factory original components. So, of course, having all of the factory original stuff is always going to help the value on rare and unusual things like this. So, anyway, really, really cool to get this in. Uh, again, came to us from a viewer in Michigan. So thank you so much for sending this one along to us. And that's going to be our number eight spot today. And of course, I'm sure I'll never see one again. This is the Automag 5 and 50 Action Express. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.